This week we're talking about strings, arrays, regular expressions, and I want to I want to begin with strings. So I'll do this in in three parts, and then we'll do some we'll do some programming that uses all of them together to give you some practice with it. But let's start out with a concept that's going to be important to all three of them, and that is we're going to be thinking about working with these data types as objects. So let me compare this with some of what you've learned about working with text in a programming language like C. So when you're in C, we think of a string. Uh, really, I mean, there is no such thing as a string. A string is this uh, made up thing. It's something that's kind of added after the fact out of need. So we have arrays of characters um, and we can do these null terminated arrays and say, you know, this is a string. We can define them a couple of ways. So there isn't really a, a built-in type. C++ does have built-in types for lots of different string libraries that we can use. But if we were going to work with strings in a C program, what we do is we define our, our array of, of characters. And then we have a whole series of functions like string length, string copy, string compare, string concatenation, etc. All of these functions, they operate on arrays of characters. So we have a separation. We have the data and we have the functions. And these two things come together when we invoke the functions on that data. Now, the way that we do this in JavaScript is different. In JavaScript, we're going to, we're going to package the data and the functionality that operates on that data into, a, into an object. So the object is going to be made up of these two parts that, that join together. They're going to be uh, data and functionality. And it's going to be the same for strings, for arrays, for all sorts of things. So this pattern is going to be really you know, something we're going to see a lot of. Now, I've made, I've made up some pretend language here, which tries to approximate what you're seeing down here. So imagine if we were working in a version of C that let us work like this. So imagine that we had a type called string. So instead of having an array of characters, we had this built-in type that is some amount of text. So we declare a type, of, a type string and we give it a value, hello. And then if we were interested in getting the length of the string, we might do something like this. We might reach into the string using dot notation. We might reach in and access a property len. So we would say, what is the length of this string? Or if we wanted to compare this string, string, our first string, to another string, string two, we might call the compare function. But notice that the compare function lives on the string. So we're saying string.compare. Or if I wanted to concatenate something, I might say string.concatenate. So the idea here is, you know, we're going to take uh, a piece of data but we're going to augment that data by adding all sorts of functionality to it. And we're going to create an object. So the data and the functionality are going to move around in the program. And if you want to do something to that string, you're going to invoke a method, which is a function that lives on, on that object. OK, so that's kind of where we end up when we work with strings in JavaScript. So a string in JavaScript is, a, is not a, an array of characters. So we don't think in terms of single characters. We think in terms of an entire string. And because JavaScript has to work for the whole world, like it's the programming language of the web, and the web is global. So the web doesn't just work in English. It has to work in every language. And so JavaScript uses Unicode strings. Um, you know, this, for example, is a valid string in JavaScript. And so we're going to... We're going to work with any kind of character, any kind of Unicode value, not just ASCII values, not just um, arrays of, of bytes. We need something that's more robust, more robust than that. So a string in JavaScript can be any length. You could have a single character, and we call that a string. You could have a novel, and we call that a string. So you could have gigabytes or megabytes or kilobytes of text, and all of those things we call strings. When you create a string, a string is immutable, which means that once the string has been created, it gets put into memory, and we have a reference to that memory, and then it'll never change. So we can have multiple variables that all refer to that, and if we want to change the data, we're going to have to create a new string. 
And so I'll show you some examples of what this means. Um, so I want to I want to show you how we can define and how we can work with um, different strings. So I've got a few lines of code here. One of the first things you're going to run into when you're writing code and when you're reading other people's code is you're going to see them defining their strings in one of three ways. So you can use single quotes to define a string, or you can use double quotes. Both of these are the same. So one doesn't have a different meaning than the other. It's, it's really personal preference. So a lot of times people will choose one or the other. And I would suggest to you that when you're writing a program, you want to be consistent. So within your program, if you want to use double quotes, you should probably use double quotes everywhere. And if you want to use single quotes, use single quotes everywhere. Uh, some people switch back and forth if they wanted to put quotes around a piece of text. So let's say I want to put double quotes around uh, some string. I might use single quotes to make that easier to be able to do it. There's a third type that I want to talk about today too, and that is a template literal. Template literal use these back ticks. So these are not single quotes, they're back ticks. I'm having trouble selecting it. There it is. That's a back tick. And we can use literals to, uh, we can do some interesting things with them, which I'll show you in a second when we want to do string interpolation. Finally, you'll see sometimes people will create a new string object. So this is calling the string constructor function and it's using the new keyword. So this will create a string object. These up here we refer to as string literals. And so um, I can use these interchangeably. So whenever I need to access properties on a string, a JavaScript will, a string literal, it'll convert it into an object for me that I can use. Okay, well, let's look at some examples here. I, was, I wanna just try and write a bunch of code with you and get you um, comfortable with using the different methods and so on. So really what I have here is I have a list of things that are common things that you can do with a string. And I want to just give you a tour of how they work and show you how, how to use them. Okay, so let's, let's write a little bit of code. So I want to define a string, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that here. So let s equals, and I'll use double quotes. Got a nice quote from William Gibson here that we'll use as our, uh, as our, our text that we'll play around with. Uh, okay, so the first thing to note about working with strings is that we can connect strings together. We can concatenate uh, strings. So as an example, let's say that I wanted to put a period at the end of this string right there. I want to put a period in here. So what I want to be able to do is I want to console.log s, but I also want to add on to the end of that a period. So I want to do string concatenation like so. And um, if I run this, I get the string, but I get the period, I get the period at the end. Okay. Um, what about wrapping this in quotes? Well, first of all, what if I did this not as a, uh, let's say let sentence is equal to s, plus uh, s plus a period and I console log sentence. So I'll just put it into a put it into a variable. So what if I wanted to change my sentence and what if I wanted to make it um, make it a quote. So I want to I want to wrap quotes around it. So I could say let quote is equal to so I want to say I want to I want to put a, I want to put a double quote around the edge of this. Well, I have a couple ways I could do it. One way I could do it is I could use single quotes. I could say, I want to have a string that contains a double quote, and I want to add S to that, and I want to add another that looks like that. So that's one way that I could do it. Let's print it out, console.log quote. And if we run this, we get, we get those two things right there. If I changed this to sentence, instead I would get it with a with a period at the end like so. Okay. So um, 
You can also, if you didn't want to, uh, if you wanted to stick with double quotes, so if I wanted to put a double quote in here, I would need to escape the quote like that. So you can also do character escapes if you want to use a consistent quoting style. If you don't want to use a single quote or a double quote, these, these will work the same way. So if I were to run this, you'll see that I get the same, I get the same result. So here I'm using single quotes to do it. Here I'm using double quotes and I'm escaping this in order to achieve it. Another way to do this, which is a more modern thing you can do in JavaScript, is you can use these template literals. So the idea, let's do this uh, quote to is equal to. The idea with a template literal is that instead of using double quotes or single quotes, I'm going to use these two back ticks. And when you're not used to seeing these, they look very similar to single quotes if you just look quickly. So you'll have to get yourself used to looking for them because they're becoming more and more common when you're um, when you're working with when you're working with JavaScript code. Okay, so the idea with a template literal is you can put any uh, text that you want in here. I can put any string that I want in here, A, B, C, D. But what you can also do is you can embed expressions that you want to be evaluated and the result concatenated into the string. So if you take a look at what we're doing here, we are wrapping the um, sentence in quotes or up here, we're, we're putting a period at the end. Okay. So let me show you how I would do each of these. Let's do this sentence to is equal to, I'll just show you both. So if I was going to do this in a template literal, what I might do is I might say that I want to put a period at the end of the string. So I just put a period like so, but then I want to put whatever the value of S is right here. So I can't put S because if I put S, it means just the letter S. What I want is I want the value that is stored at S. So whatever the value of this variable is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this in the following syntax. So anything that you put in this syntax is going to be interpolated into the string. So it's going to get the, the value of S is going to be evaluated and then it's going to be concatenated to this dot right here. So if I was to try this out, let's let's change our code. I'll just comment this out. And um, if I ran this again, you can see that I've got the same result. So it's it, it's put this here. If I was to do this code here using template literals, let's think about what I want. I want to have two quotes. And then in the middle of the quotes, I want to put my sentence or my quote here. So I want to take I want to interpolate my sentence in here. So I'm going to take the sentence, get its value, and then wrap it in quotes like this. So if we do this, we get back the same, we get back the same value. So which of these is the better way to do it? I don't know. I think that using string concatenation with a plus sign can be problematic because you can sometimes, it gets confusing what is part of the string and what is outside the string, especially when you're adding quotes onto things. Um, these template literals are really nice because you can do all sorts of interesting things with them. So I could, you know, a template literal can have anything that you want inside it. So you could say let uh, S2 is equal to a template literal the answer to 2 plus 2 is equal to 2 plus 2. So if you look at this here, what are we doing? We're, we, have a, we have a string literal right here that we're going to put in. And then we also have an expression that we want to evaluate. So what you put inside of here, this expression can be any valid JavaScript expression. You could call a function, like if you had a function add one and one, one and two or whatever. You could call the add function. You can call, you can do anything you want in here. Any valid JavaScript can go here that returns a result that gives you back a value. So I will tend to use the template literal approach as a way of making my code a little more succinct. 
However, when you're getting used to it, you can choose. So if you find working with uh, the concatenation to be easier for you to wrap your head around, then that's something you could do. Okay, so let's say that we want to uh, we want to combine some of this stuff. I'm going to delete this. Let's write a function, a function that takes a string and adds a period at the end um, of the function and gives me back that. So let's let's write a function add period takes a string s and what I want to do is I want to return s plus a period like so, okay? So let's try running this with a few things. So if I were to say um, console.log add period, and if I call it with S, what does that do? So that, that gives us what we want, that's good. What if I said, what if I passed in uh, the number one? What would that do? So that's interesting. So I passed in a number, and what it has done here is it has said, um, if, if I take, if I say one plus that, what it does is it, it turns that into a string. So JavaScript is going to take types that are not string types, and if you try and concatenate them together, it's gonna turn them into a, it's gonna turn it into a string. So what if I passed in nothing? So what is the value of S here? Well, we know that the value of S when you don't pass anything in is undefined. Just like if I said let X, what is the value of X? The value of X is undefined. It has never been defined with a value. So here I'm saying S, what is the value of S? The value of S is undefined and we're gonna add undefined plus a period. What the, what's that gonna print out? So we get, we literally get the word undefined and then a dot. And you maybe have run into this on the web. You've maybe seen places in, uh, on the web where um, people have uh, literally the word undefined appears in some weird place on a web page. And you're like, why, why does it say undefined? This doesn't make any sense. And it's because somebody has a bug where they are passing in something that doesn't exist and they are then combining it together. We could maybe improve our function a little bit. So let's say if, um, if, if S exists, if it's truthy, so if we get a value that is truthy, then let's return S plus uh, the period. And if S is not truthy, so if we have undefined or null or zero or something like that, then why don't we just return, well, we could decide what we're gonna do. Maybe we're gonna return the empty string or maybe we're gonna return just a period like this. So let's try that. So if I run this code now, what happens? I get a period. What if I change this to null? I get just a period. What if I change this to the empty string? I get just a period, etc. So, and what if I change this back to S and I pass in my sentence? I get my sentence, like so. So when you're doing concatenation of types where one of them is a string, then you just have to be careful because it's going to, it's gonna convert that into a, it's gonna convert it into a string rather. So if I pass in a number, it's gonna turn that number into a string. Okay. So what other kinds of things can we do with, with S? Well, we said that S is an object. And so if I, let me show you, let me get my browser up here, uh, open up my console. If I were to um, do this exact same code I'll just copy it and paste it over here. So S is that right there. If I say S dot, you'll see that I have all of these different things that live on the S object. So these are all different methods and properties and things that I can do with S. 
So the, the, the first one that I want to look at is this one, s.length. So if I want to know how many characters there are in this, I can say s.length and it will give me back a number. It'll say there are 75 characters in this. Or if I have the empty string and I ask for the length of the empty string, I get back zero. So we can always ask a we can always ask a string what is your length and you'll notice that length is not a function so i'm not saying s.length like so right s.length is not a function so that throws an error because length is not a function it's a property it's just a variable so because strings don't change when the string gets created the length can get stamped into it the length of this string is 75, and it, it will always be 75, okay? So we can say, what is the length of s? s.length is 75. We can, also, we can also reach into the string and we can extract different letters. So if s is this string right here, and if I say, give me s at position three, what does it mean? Or let's say position two, what does it mean? So we are able to index into the string, just like you would when we were talking about working with a C, C style string. This uh, position, it's a zero based index. So S at zero is equal to T, S at one is equal to H, etc. I can reach into those and I could reach, I could say S at length, um, S at S dot length minus one is equal to the last position in this string. JavaScript gives us two ways to reach into a string like this. You can either do the indexing notation like I'm doing here as if it's an array, but you can also do s dot character at, and I could say, I wanna know what is at position 15. At position 15 is the letter H, okay? So when you want to get information about a string, we can look, we can say, what is the length of the string? What is the letter at a particular position? Or what is the character at a particular position in the string? We can do other things. So if I have S that looks like this, I could say, what is the index of, um, well, let's say the word above. Where does above appear in this string? So I can ask that information by calling a function. So I can say s.index of, and then I can look for a substring. So I could say, what is the index of above? It's eight. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is the beginning of the beginning of that string. If I were to say, what is the index of A, it is also the same. It's the same thing, right? So it's telling me where is the beginning of the substring. If I did, what is the position of OR? What is the index of OR? Sometimes we'll have, um, we'll have these, we'll have multiple of these when you're going through the string. Like it'll, it'll go through and find either the first or the last of these things. We'll talk about that in a second. So I have, when I'm doing index of, if I look for something that's not there, it returns to me a special value of negative one. So a string position is zero or more. You'll never have a negative one index when you're uh, when you're looking inside of a string. So if you say, what is the index of, like for example, what is the index of the period in this string? Well, there isn't one. So another way to say, can you look at this string and tell me if um, this character exists inside or this substring exists inside of the string, it will tell you whether or not it exists or not. So we have index of, and we also have last index of. So depending upon, um, like here you can see I've got OR and I've got another OR right here. And so you can ask for the index to begin 
from the front of the string forward, or you can say, give me the last index of, so try and find something for me further on into the string when you are doing this. Okay, so we can say, what is the length? 75. What is the character at position five? It's a K. What is the character at position five? It's a K. We could say, um, what is the index of the letter K? Not surprisingly, it's five, right? So all of these things work together like this. S dot last index of K is also five. So there's only one K in this string. But if I, if I look for the index of a letter like, let's say the letter E, whoops. What is the position of E? It's two. And what is the last index of E? It's 73. So there's multiple E's in there. What is the index of the question mark character? Well, it doesn't exist. Negative one. We don't have it in there. So we can get character positions or information about the string using, using these uh, indices like this, okay? So could we rewrite our function over here? Could we write a function to add a period, but we only want to add a period if it doesn't have a period at the end. So what would that look like? So if we had a function add period, takes um, takes a value and what I want it to do is I want to say um, console.log add period s it should return to me a string but it should return to me a string that has a period at the end so if I print this out twice let's do it once like this and once like this Think about what this is going to do. So in the first case, I'm passing in my sentence, S. In the second case, I'm passing in my sentence with a dot at the end. So I want this thing to always return the same value. So what we could do is we could return value plus a period, but that's, that's going to mess up. But let's just try that for a second. Let's see what that would do. So if we were to come here and run this, what do we get? It works the first time. But the second time we have a bug because now we're getting multiple periods. All right, so let's see if we can fix this. So I'd like to know if the last character in the sentence is equal to a period. So first of all, what is the last position in this sentence? So we could say let last position is equal to the length of the value. And because it is zero base, that's always going to be one larger than we want. So the index or the position within that is going to be one less than that. So the last position is this. So we could say if value dot character at last position is equal to a period, then return the value without adding a period to it. Otherwise, let's return the value with a period added onto the end. Does that work? That works. That's pretty good. We could flip our logic here. It might make more sense to you to um, Maybe we only add the period if it's necessary. So we might say, what if it's not equal to a period? If it's not equal to a period, then we're going to return, um, return it with this. Otherwise, return the value as it is. We could do it like that. And that works too. 
So if we wanted to, we could decide whether or not we need this variable here. So when you're writing your code, you wanna think about making your code readable. So let me ask you a question. Is it more or less readable if I do this? So if I came down here and wrote my code like that, that code is presumably gonna run the exact same way it does. Is it more or less readable? If I'm looking at this code quickly, it's a little bit it takes me a little bit longer to figure out what this code is doing because I have in my head, I have to figure out what this value is. Whereas if I give it a name, last position or last character or something like that, it's a little bit easier for me to do this. How else could I write this? Well, I could say is the last character, the last position, if I index it, is that a period? So we could do this. And that works too. So we have a number of ways that we could go about writing this code in order to make this uh, in order to make this work. We could write it another way. We could say, um, "Is the in uh, is the last index of the period equal to?" the last position in the string. What does that mean? So if the period appears in the final position, in the final index of the string, then we know there's a period already there, so we don't need to return a period. Or if we say if it's not equal to it, then we add the period to it. Does that work? That works too. So this is good. So we can we can ask questions of our string. We can concatenate things together. What if we wanted to return this using a template literal? So what if we said, let's return our value, whatever it is, followed by a period. Would that work? Yep, yeah, that works too. So we could do this a number of ways. And I want you to get comfortable with all of these different ways. It takes practice. When you're programming with other people or you're working on code at a company and you're working on a big project, people are going to write their code using slightly different styles. So JavaScript gives you this API, this application programming interface for strings. So if you wanna work with string data, here are a bunch of methods you can call, here are a bunch of things you can do. And so you have to take your problem and you have to break the problem up into something that works using these things. Okay, let's run through a few more things. What else can we do? Well, the code that we're writing here, actually there's some easy things we can, uh, there's some handy tools that have been created for us. So one of the things that we've been doing is we've been checking to see if a string ends with a period. Well, it turns out that strings have a method called ends with. So I can say, does this string end with a period? It doesn't. Does this string end with the letter L? It does. Does this string end with the word channel? It does. So you can ask your program, you can say, or ask your string, do you end with a value? So over here we could say, um, if value.ends with a period, if it ends with a period, then return the value without a period. Or we could say, if it doesn't end with a period, then return this on to the end. So if, does this work? That works. So we have another way of doing this. So what's nice about this is that now I can get rid of all this positional information and this reads a lot more like English. We could even write this in a, in a single line. We could say return value.ends with a period. If it ends with a period, then return the value without doing anything. If it doesn't end with a period, then let's return the value with a period at the end. Let's write it like that. Using a ternary operator, does that work? That works. So we could write this in different ways and, and all of these different methods are valid for doing this. So we can say, does this end with? Now you probably know what's coming next. Does it start with 
the letter T. No, it doesn't start with the letter T, but does it start with the capital letter T? It does. Does it start with the word the? It does. Does it start with the word the plus a space? It does, etc. So we can use starts with and ends with in order to do this. Okay, um, what, else can we, what else can we ask of this? Well, we can say, does it, instead of looking at the start or the end, we can say, does it include, does S includes some, some, uh, some string that we want to look for? For example, does it include the word sky? It does. Does it include the word dark? It does not. So where we said s.index of, how are these different? Includes gives us a Boolean value. True or false, does this string include this or not include this? When we say index of, we get the same information. But instead of getting a Boolean, true or false, we get a number which is either zero or greater or negative one if it's false. So you can use both of these depending on what your goal is. If your goal is to find the position of something, you probably want to use index of. If your goal is to check if something is in there, then you would say um, includes. So you have both of these. So we can do s dot starts with, s dot ends with, S dot includes, and there's some other ones too, which I'll talk about in a later video. S dot match, um, which allows us to use regular expressions um, to do ch to do more complex checks, but I won't do that right now. Okay, so far everything that we've done has been about asking questions of a string, and so what I want to do now is I want to look at being able to um, change the value that's stored in a string. So a minute ago I told you that, um, you know, let uh, we have s. If I say s2 is equal to s, what does that mean? s is equal to this, s2 is equal to this. They both refer to the same string. So what if I say s2 is equal to um, abc? What will the value of s be? Has s's value changed? No, it hasn't changed. So that string hasn't changed at all. What we've done here is we've created a brand new string and we've referred s2 to this brand new string. This is not, this doesn't have any influence on what's happening over here. So what if we said something like s2 is equal to s plus this? Does that change the value of s? No. Does it change the value of S2? Yes, because we've created a brand new string. So you're always going to have to create new strings when you do this. So there's some things that we can do with a string when we want to make changes to them. So I've got a list of all these different things that we're working through down here. So let me just take you on a tour of some of these things. So one of them that we can do is we could say uh, let um, name is equal to I have a string that uh, looks like this. So name is a string, but it has all this extra space on the beginning and the end. So if we want to, we can say name.trim. And what it'll do is it will trim off all this extra white space. But I want you to notice something. Name has not been changed. Name.trim, what does it do? It takes the value of the string removes the excess front and back white space, but then it returns back to you a brand new string. If I wanted to make name refer to that, I could say name equals name.trim, and now name equals the, the value that we had before with all of those things trimmed off of it. Okay, what about this? Name.to lower case. So name equals that. Everything's uppercase. Name dot to lowercase is like this. If I said name equals name dot to lowercase, name is now equal to this lowercase string. How do I go the other way? Name equals name dot to uppercase. 
So now name is the uppercase string. So if you have a string ABC and you call two uppercase like so, you're going to get back, uh, you're going to get back the string. Could we, well, let me go a little further here. Let me go further before we try another example. So we can trim the spaces off. We can convert it to uppercase. We can convert it to lowercase. Um, what about, here's our original string. Our original string has the word color without a U. It has C-O-L-O-R. What if I wanted to change that to uh, color Canadian style spelling of that? So I could say S dot replace. I want to replace the value color with color. And so now I get back a new string. Has S been changed? No, S has not been changed, right? I've, I've, I've replaced the value in the string, but I haven't modified the original string. So um, again, all of these functions that we're talking about, all these methods, they're going to return a new value to you. Uh, let's, try, let's try another one. Here's S. What if we said s dot slice 10, 12? What did that just do? Or let's let's go a little further. Let's say let's do 8 and 12, 8 and 13. What have we done here? Start at index 8 and go to index 13. So if we say s at 8 is equal to what? Yes, s at 13 is equal to the space. So you can see that what it's done is it's gone from eight up to, but not including the final position. And it has given us this, it has sliced out or cut out this, this string. What if I said um, s dot slice from eight onward? And then I get something that looks like this. So here's a challenge. How would I get everything after the comma in this sentence? What would we do? Well, we need to know where this comma is. So let's, let's write the code. Let's write it over here. So the first question we have is, um, where is the comma? So we could say um, let comma position is equal to uh, value dot index of comma, like that, okay? So what are the possible return values? So if we said here, if we said s dot index of the comma, we get 50. Um, what if we had a string a, b, c, d dot index of comma, we get negative one. So the possibilities are that we either are going to have negative one or we're not. So we're going to say if comma position is equal to negative one, that means it wasn't found. So let's just return the entire value because we know, so no comma found. However, if the comma is found, then what could we do? Well, we could return the string value and we could slice it starting at the position of the comma. So if we said comma position like that, what would that return to us? So down here, if I were to console.log um, after comma, like so, let's make some more room here. What does that return? Okay, that's not bad, but it's not perfect. So what has it done? It has found the comma, 
and it has included the comma inside this. So we have an off by one error here. So the position of the comma, we wanna go one further than the position of the comma. We wanna add one to this position. So what if we do that, what do we get? That's pretty good, but we still have this extra space at the front here. How do we get rid of extra space in a string? Well, we know that if we have a string that looks like this, if that's my string, if I wanna get rid of that extra space, I could call trim and get rid of the extra space on it. So why don't we do that? So one of the things you can do with strings is you can, you can use with objects that return values, you can use what's called chaining. So if I have a, if I have a string like this, I could say to uppercase, and um, and trim. So what have we done when we do this? We take we take a string value, we call a method like two uppercase. Two uppercase returns a new string. We take that new string and we call trim on it, and it does this. In our case, what we want to do is we want to take value, we want to slice it, and we want to slice it at the position of the comma plus one. And then we want to trim that value so that it doesn't have any leading spaces, any extra spaces. So if I save this, how does it look? That looks pretty good. So that is giving us just the bit at the end of at the end of our sentence from here, from here over. Okay. Okay, so that's probably a good place for us to pause this one. Um, what I've done in the notes is I've linked to lots of these, all the things that we're talking about today, I've linked to the functions in the developer documentation. So if you're looking at something like starts with and you wanna get some in more information about starts with, how does it work? You can come here and you can read the syntax and you can read all the different ways that you can call these functions. So with all of this stuff, Every developer has to go and look up and read the docs, so I want you to be comfortable looking at the docs as well. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna switch over and do same sort of look at uh, working with arrays.